Good morning. Good morning. I am Pat McDaniels, and I will be your worship associate today. <clears throat> Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Wayne County. We are a diverse congregation that welcomes you as you are, regardless of your age, ethnicity, race, sexual orientation, gender identity, economic status, or physical ability. We come together to seek deeper meaning and understanding from each other and the world around us. Your presence here today is a gift that brings us closer to that understanding. We're an active community. We live our values beyond the hours of Sunday service. And I would like to... Can you hear me? Okay. So, as I said, we are an active community that lives its values beyond the hours of Saturday, I mean Sunday service. And I would like to call your attention to the following. Join us in spreading the love by ordering a UUFWC Side with Love t-shirt or hoodie. The membership committee has a table set up in the back of the lobby so that you can place your order or you can go to our website or the February newsletter for online ordering. Sample shirt sizes are available to help you to place an accurate size order. This will be a great way to sort of advertise uh, both our congregation and our value of being on the side of love. For more information, Please contact Laura Grimm or Karen Skew. Whoa, sorry. Now you're away. It's not speed dating, but it's similar. On Saturday, February 10th at 7 p.m., we will hold our annual meet and greet, also known as wine, cheese, and conversation. Please see the sign up station uh, in the lobby for more information. Registration is required for this fun evening when everyone brings a beverage and or a snack to share and we rotate around to assigned tables to answer posed questions which will help us learn more about the heart and minds of your fellow UUs. Also, this is the last week that anti-gerrymandering signatures will be collected here at the fellowship. With enough signatures and votes in November, citizens and not politicians will provide fair political redistricting in Ohio. Look for Nancy Yoder or Burt Bishop. Is Burt in here? There, that's Burt Bishop uh, in the lobby. Nancy's not here today. If you would like to find out more about our activities, feel free to ask Karen Skubik. Where is she? Karen's not oh, here. she's not here. Okay. Um, uh, to see if there's any visitors, I don't know. I, I got this, I got this. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. You'll notice that I am not Karen Skubik. I am the Reverend Walter Clark, uh, called minister of this congregation. Karen is currently home sick with COVID. Um, her husband decided to share with her all of that he had to offer. Um, it sounds like so far symptoms are mild, and so we're going to continue to hope that they stay that way. And we, of course, want Karen or anyone else who is feeling under the weather to take care of themselves. And so we have volunteers who will be helping to take her spot and we are going to be wonderfully set and we wish her all well. So I want to, first of all, I'm gonna do some welcoming. The first people I want us to welcome is anybody who is watching us online. So those who feel inclined, you are welcome to turn around and wave to our cameras. Hello, online viewers. Thank you for staying in your pajamas and having a warm cup of coffee with us this morning. Um, it sounds really good. Yes, hi, Karen, exactly. Everybody say hello to Karen online. Um, Instead of having visitors stand up and uh, out themselves to uh, possible mobbing after service, 
What I want you to do is I want you to just look around at everybody and just kind of a little, good morning, you know, real quick, good morning, right? And if somebody's not making eye contact with you, it's not personal. There are introverts. We love them too. And I want to encourage you, if there is anybody who you see who is maybe less familiar to you, not necessarily new, but just less familiar, I encourage you to talk with them after service a little bit. What brings you in? It's so good to see you. So glad to have you as part of our community. For a call to worship, I want to give you all a little bit of a heads up. I'm going to be talking today about the work of the church. And I use that language intentionally, capital T, capital C, the church as a cultural institution. So I'm talking about a place where people gather together in the name of spirituality and growth. So while church is shorthand for all of the other groups, and it was just way too long to make a sermon title, The Role of Churches, Mosques, Temples, Fellowships, Monasteries, and Ethical Societies. But what I am talking about is how the work of religious community, what is it about and what is important. I will be referring to Christian theologians who have some really good things to talk about. Is anybody familiar with the concept of liberation theology? Oh, all right, very good. It's a very Christian theology and in practice is very universal, very Unitarian Universalists. And it talks a lot about things that I think overlap with us on how we see equity and justice. It is a beautiful sunny day, friends. There is a lot of sun, and there is a lot of shining out here. Welcome to our worship. Take a deep breath. Let go your worries of the week. Prepare for a new week ahead. Thank you for coming. Put your phones into worship mode, and let us worship together.
Our chalice lighting message this morning is titled, Let Us Make This Earth a Heaven, by Reverend Tess Baumberger. Let us make this earth a heaven right here, right now. Who knows what existence's death will bring? Let us create a heaven here on earth where love and truth and justice reign. Let us welcome all at our pearly gates, our freedom table, amid singing and great rejoicing, black, white, yellow, red, and all our lovely colors, straight, lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, questioning, cisgendered, transgendered, non-binary, gender non-conforming, healthy, sick, hurting, variously abled, young, old, gentle, cranky, joyous, sorrowing. Let no one feel excluded. Let no one feel alone. May all have enough to meet their needs. May all share power generously. May all venerate the earth, our mother and tend her with wisdom and compassion. May we make our earth an Eden, a paradise. May no one wish to leave her. May hate, violence, and warfare cease to clash in causes too old and too tired to name. Religion, nationalism, racism, the false god of gold, deep-rooted ethnic hatreds. May these all disperse and wane. May we see each other's true selves. May we all dwell together in peace and joy and understanding. Let us make a heaven here on earth before it is too late. Let us make this earth a heaven for each other's sake. Let us now rise and body your spirit as we sing our opening hymn. The music can be found in the great hymnal number 113, Where is Our Holy Church? I want to take a moment to invite anybody who'd like to be up here a little closer for this time right now. I'm going to, okay, I'm going to sit down today on this bean bag. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So I'm sitting down here today because I have some questions that I want to ask you, and I really want to hear your answers, and so I want to be a little closer. Excuse me, Kelly. Okay? And I really want to hear y'all's answers. And I am curious in your answers, too. Actually, what I would suggest is I have questions to ask that you might have answers for. Turn to your neighbor and share with your neighbor because they might be curious. So that's what we're doing today. 
So lots of times during this time, good morning, good morning, we tell a story lots of times, right? I don't forget about this, so I'm going to move it for right now. We tell a story, and or maybe sometimes, once in a while, we sing a song, or we meditate, um, do an activity, something like that. Well, today, we are going to talk a little bit, and we are going to do a spiritual practice. So, all those things I just talked about, a story, or a song, or um, meditating, those can be a spiritual practice, too. Or doing exercise. Or doing exercise can be a spiritual practice. That is actually true. Yes, you are correct. Um, so, but we're going to talk a little bit about it. Practice. Does anybody practice anything? And would you like to tell me what it is oh, you practice? Oh, oh sometimes um, I, well, I shoot the BB gun. And you practice at that? All right. Accuracy is important. That was my sister's. My sister practiced basketball. Basketball. Okay. Does anybody else have anything they practice? We pass these. We're going to pass it today because I can't help up and down. Practice soccer. Okay. Anybody else have anything they practice? Tell your neighbor. Tell your neighbor. I practice piano. Okay. <clears throat> Saxophone. All right. I got nothing. <laughs> Can you? Somebody grab that for me. All right. Stand no, that's okay. All right. Oh, Ellie, I'm sorry. I practice acting. You practice acting. Okay. So all of those things, why do you practice? Somebody, Ellie, why do you practice? Because uh, I want to get good at acting so okay. I can be in a show sometime. Okay. Why do you practice soccer, Kaylin? Um, yeah, kind of for the same reason, so I can get better and kind of be successful. Okay. And what does it mean to practice? What's, what does it mean to practice? Um, to get better at something. Okay. Somebody says we do the same thing over and over. Does that sound like what your practice looks like? You do the same well, thing over and over? Well, sometimes, um, well, practicing is um, I sometimes don't, Shoot the BB gun. Okay. We don't do all the same things all the time. Nope. Okay. So you practice because you want to get better. And what does it take to practice? Um, Besides doing it over and over. Anything else? Oh, Olivia. Dedication. Dedication. Commitment. Time. Time. Roblox. Roblox. Did you say Roblox or Road Blocks? Road. Roblox. It's, Roblox. It's a, um, a game that has a ton of games in it. And you practice that? Yep. Okay. I do it every day. Every day. That's practice. It's a commitment to that. Okay. And sometimes practice means you have to focus, right? Do you think, does that make sense, Kayla? You have to focus. Focus means you really have to kind of take all the other stuff outside of you and, and get it out of your head. And can we agree on that? You might have to, if you're playing piano, you might have to really focus your body, your hands, your ears. You focus on the music. And, and you can't be thinking about what you're going to do later, really. You can play the piano and think about what you're going to do later, but that's not as much practice, right? It's focus. One, this one singular thing. Okay, so I said spiritual practice. So where's your, where do you feel your spirit? Anybody want to tell me where do you feel your spirit? That's okay. Where do you feel your spirit? Did I see it? Right back there. Oh, I'm sorry. You feel your spirit in your coffee cup. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Where do you feel your spirit? Come on. Anybody? Do you have a spirit? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, someone else. Thank you. 
I feel my spirit in loving animals. In loving everyone. animals, okay. All right. Oh, there's one over there. You feel your spirit in the woods. In the woods. Okay. So we have spiritual practice. We have to focus. It might be something that we have to focus. We have to do it a lot. We want to get better at it. Focus means moving away all the other extraneous things. Okay? And why... And, What's the dinosaur say? She feels it's, she feels the spirit about um, making airplanes. All right, feels the spirit about making airplanes. Thank you, dinosaur. So, some people might think storytelling is a spiritual practice, right? Or or feel that it's a story. I do, and I practice it because I want to share stories with people. Some people sing and they practice because that is very spiritual to them and, and that's important. And some people sing as a spiritual practice that is just important to them. And they, it's still the thing they do all the time, but maybe they don't do it for you or me. Maybe they sing in the shower, you know? But it's still a spiritual practice. Okay. So... Wonder Box. Did you think I forgot about the Wonder Box? I put it right here so I wouldn't because it's not unusual for me to forget things. Okay. So, well, let's hold on one second. We got a Wonder Box here. Now, when we open this Wonder Box today, we're not going to take anything out, but we're going to look at it, and I want everybody to see what's in it, so you might have to come around, some of you that are a little further out there. At least want all the people of less stature to be able to see what's in here. So go ahead and open it. What's in there? Candles. Candles? What else is in there? Chalices. Chalices. Okay. How many chalices are there? One, One two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven chalices. How many candles are there? Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Wait. Are there more candles than chalices? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 19 candles and would we say seven chalices okay all right that's okay we're going to take our word there's more than the other okay so will somebody light one of those chalices hawthorne will you light one to start with pick one there's 19. it doesn't matter they're all the same i made sure they all work all right, go ahead, put it back in there. Okay, now let's peek. Is there a little more light in there? Yeah. A little more light in there? Yeah. Okay, okay. Could you light another one, please? Uh -huh. Thank you. Go ahead, Julia. Could you light one, please? Wait, we're going to have another one. Oh, there it is. I hide. I hid it. Let's turn them on and put them in. There you go. Keep it. Okay. Wait, do we turn them on? Not, not yet. Go ahead, put it in there. All right, all right. Let's peek. Is there more light now? Yeah. Oh, the light's starting to come out the top of the basket. All right, let's get them all lit. You want to help, Ellie? This might take us a minute. So while we're lighting all of these chalices, more than one light in every chalice. Why is this one? Oh, I was... So more than one light in every chalice. Okay. So how do the candles here get their light? Where does it come from? Um, from inside of the candles. Batteries. From the batteries, right. I just touched fire. Wait. So they get from the batteries. And what, what are the batteries? Wait, I think, I think that's... What is the battery for these candles? What is it like? This one ran out. Oh, well, you know. So it, this one ran out of energy. Energy. That's what's in there. Yep. You said batteries, but batteries hold energy, don't they? And it's a good thing we have lots, and since one's not working today, okay? That's oh, okay. All right. So energy. Where is energy? Um, everywhere. Everywhere. Energy. Hawthorne says energy is everywhere. 
like yep. everywhere. Just name some more specific things. Oh, um, this one's uh, we got sunshine. That's the big one. Energy. It ran out of energy. Well, that's okay. Put it in there. That's the same one. Where else is there energy? Anybody? Energy. In, my heart. Okay. in your bodies. In your heart. In your heart. Where else is there energy? Ellie, do you know where there's energy? In your body in general, right? So energy is all around. Well, could you, where is it? In your brain. No, I, like where is it? It's kind point of to in, it. It's a little in your brain. There it is in your brain. Can you point to it? Well, that's your brain. Obviously. Yeah, that is true. Well, there's Can you point to the energy? Heads. Right. That's right. Okay. The energy is in all of us. The energy is everywhere. And look at that. Look how, look at, we're going to close our basket now. Look at the light is coming out of that basket. Yeah, guess what else? Energy. Right. Let me give you another word. How about an L word? Love. An L word. Love. love. Say it again loud. Um, Did you say love? Love. Love. <laughs> right. Does love have energy? No. Yes. But we just said everything it has, has energy. It has tons of energy. Well, there's energy in batteries. There is energy in batteries. It has tons of energy. It has energy. tons of energy. Okay. So, right now, we have talked about a spiritual practice. We have talked about love, and we have talked about energy. And now we're going to close our basket. Please. Thank you. I could see yeah, the Yeah, we can light. see the light. See the light. See the energy coming out. Okay. So, we can use a spiritual practice to gather the energy of love. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Well, what? A spiritual practice to gather the energy of love. Now, if you didn't know that, we're going to give that a shot today, okay? Well, I don't know it. Well, we'll give it a shot today. And that's a really important thing to do. And I'm going to raise up one thing that made me think of why we want to do this today. Um, we have a friend, Miss Joanna. I don't know, some of you might know her. She works here. And Miss Joanna has children, and some of you might know her children, Ezra and Thea and Jude. Okay. Well, Ezra is the oldest of her children, and he was in a car accident yesterday. Has anybody been in a car accident before? Nope. Well, or know my somebody? bumped into a car. He did. Mm -hmm. hmm. But it didn't even break. That's good. So Ezra was in a car accident, and he got hurt. And that's really scary. Like, if you got hurt, your mom would be scared, right? Mm -hmm. Even though she's a nurse, well, she would I'm be scared. Well, I'm scared of the dark. That's okay, too. Um, I have so, Miss Joanna and Ezra and Thea and Jude and their whole family mm -hmm. need some extra love and energy. So, we're going to do a spiritual practice right now, okay? We're going to direct that energy to them. Now, if you don't know them, that's okay. You can imagine love. And today, we're going to choose to do our spiritual practice with eyes closed. The more you practice on something, you might pick different ways I to do it. But you. today, we're going to close our eyes, and we're going to close our mouths for just a minute. Because we all have very important things to say. But right now, we're going to do that focus, remember? So I want you to imagine whatever love is for you inside your head and inside your body. I want you to hold your hands out, if you can, if you want to, and start to gather all that energy and all that love that's available. The love in your heart, the love in the world, the energy in the trees, and I want you to gather it together. And then I want you to put it with my energy and my love and with Kaylin's and Emmett's, and Olivia's, and Ellie's energy, and Hawthorne's energy, and all the people's energy, and gather it. Imagine what that energy looks like in this room, right now, in our beautiful community. And I want you to imagine, no, I don't want you to imagine, I want you to take that energy, and I want you to push it. If we all push it together, we can get it there. Towards Miss Joanna and her family and the doctors 
and the nurses who are helping take care of Ezra, for the strength and that they're having their best days. They can feel that. They can feel that. Blessed be. I invite all of you to sing our children out with our children's blessing to their classrooms. You go with me. Please join me now in the spirit of meditation and prayer. There's a lot of energy in this congregation. There is a lot of love. Each one of you contains a light. Each one of you contains beauty love, mercy. Each one of you holds an immense power in just being who you are. Each one of you contains an energy, an energy that we forget has power to change the world. We think of love as soft and gentle, and often it needs to be. But we forget that love is a battery. We forget that our love, when combined with the love of others, creates so much light and so much power that we can change the world. We forget sometimes to lean into that power because there seems to be so much stopping us from using it. And I say to you, you are enough. I say to you, you are powerful. And I say to you that your love can, will, and must change the world. Never be afraid to embrace your power, for you are loved and we need you. I want to lift up some of the joys and sorrows of our congregation. We are holding Laura Grimm in our hearts as her friend Sue is going through cancer treatment. It is hard to love a friend through these situations. It is hard to watch friends suffer. And as she says so eloquently, cancer sucks. We wish your friend all of the healing energy we wish you all of the support as you go through this. I also want to lift up the congregation in Kent, the UU congregation there. On Monday, their minister, the Reverend Stephen Portsman, died suddenly. He had a heart attack uh, during an operation. They have a lot of support at the Kent congregation. Uh, they have two community ministers who can help them with services and such. And I may ask some of our pastoral care team 
to come and visit with them and their members because to lose a minister so suddenly can be devastating. So we hold them in our hearts. And as indicated by Jenny, and as many of you may know, last night at about 7.30 after a basketball game, the College of Worcester, Ezra was hit by a car walking in the crosswalk. He suffered a fractured leg, pelvis, skull injuries. Um, he was taken to the Worcester Hospital and then shortly uh, medevaced to Akron's Children's. Uh, and last I checked, about an hour ago, he was just going into surgery. It is so hard when a child is hurt in such a devastating way. And I can tell already there is so much love and outpouring for Joanna. And I've already asked people, what are we going to do to help? We're going to do something. And I will keep you posted on that. Some people have suggested gift cards. Some people are going to go up and visit. And while I appreciate all of that, I do want to remind everybody that Joanna is still a very private person. And she is going through a lot right now. And she has an incredible family support network. So I want to say, not, I don't want to say to not reach out to Joanna. And some of you, if she's reached out to you already, that's wonderful. But to keep that in mind, I will be going and visiting her. I will be glad to relay messages, cards, what have you. But we hold her, her husband Carl, Thea, Jude, we hold them in our hearts and we pray for Ezra's speedy and complete recovery in this time. We all have our sorrows that we bring into this community. And I want to invite you now in our Joys and Sorrows Stones ritual, if there is something weighing on your heart, to place a stone in the water to help you release it. And if there is a joy in your heart, something to celebrate, I would encourage you to do the same, for we need all of the joys we can get. If you would like me to get in touch with you later this week to talk about something that is on your heart, I will be here. I will have my hands out. Just touch one of my hands to let me know. Also, Chris Struzik, who is on our pastoral care team, is also willing to meet with people as well. If you want to meet with him or set up an appointment with a pastoral care associate, touch his hands and we'll reach out to you after service. I now invite you to sing Spirit of Life as we do our Joys and Sorrows Stone Ritual.
Our faith is centered on the belief that we <clears throat> can make this world a better place for all who dwell in it. In order to realize that vision, we need both the motivation and the means. <clears throat> Your donation helps the community put its faith into action by supporting our programming and facilities. This morning and throughout the month of February, donations that are not designated for another purpose will be split with the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI. NAMI provides advocacy, education, support, and public awareness so that all individuals and families affected by mental illness can build better lives. Join me in this unison reading. The words are on the screens. Let us be grateful when we are able to give, for many do not have that privilege. Let us be grateful for those who share their gifts with us, for we are enriched by their giving. Let us be grateful even for our needs, so that we may learn from the generosity of others. Our reading this morning <clears throat> comes from Richard Rohr, an American Franciscan priest who started the Center of Action and Contemplation, which provides spiritual grounding for activists and justice leaders. One of the few subversive texts in history is the Bible. The Bible is most extraordinary because it repeatedly and invariably legitimizes the people on the bottom, not the people on the top. Rejected sons, barren women, sinners, lepers, or outsiders are always the ones chosen by God. It's rather obvious when pointed out to us, <clears throat> in every case, we are presented with some form of powerlessness. And from that situation, God creates a new kind of power. This is the constant pattern found hidden in plain sight. We repeatedly see God showing barren women favor in the Hebrew scriptures. Sarah, Abraham's wife, was barren and passed childbearing years when God blessed her with a baby. Rachel, Jacob's wife, was barren until God opened her womb and she bore Joseph. Baron Hannah poured out her soul before the Lord, and God gave her Samuel. Even before Moses, God chose a nobody, Abraham, and made him a somebody. God chose Jacob over Esau. Even though Esau was the elder, more earnest son, 
and Jacob was a shifty, deceitful character. Election has nothing to do with worthiness, but only divine usability. And in the Bible, usability normally comes from having walked through one's own wrongness or littleness. God chose Israel's first king, Saul, out of the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest and weakest tribe. The pattern always seems <clears throat> to be that the last will be first and the first will be last. We see this especially in Mary, a humble servant. This is so consistently the pattern that we no longer recognize its subversive character. One of the more dramatic biblical stories in this regard is the story of David. God chose him, the youngest and least experienced son of Jesse, to be king over the nation. His father, who had many sons, did not even mention David as a possibility, but left him out in the fields. David was thus the forgotten son, who then became the beloved son of Yahweh, the archetypal whole man of Israel laying the foundation for the son of David, Jesus. In case after case, the victim becomes the real victor, leading philosopher Rene Girard to speak of the privileged position of the most victimized victim as, as the absolutely unique and revolutionary perspective of the Gospels. Without it, we are hardly prepared to understand the folly of the cross of Jesus. Without this bias from the bottom, religion ends up defending propriety instead of human pain. The status quo instead of the suffering masses, triumphalism instead of truth, clerical privilege instead of charity and compassion, and this from the Christianity that was once turning the whole world upside down. So before I get too deep into some of the meaning of these Christian and Hebrew scriptures, I want to talk about a, a theology that seems to be a little bit more popular in the United States right now, and that's the NFL. So for those of you who may not be familiar, right, so let's, let's do this, let's do this. How many of you do not care one iota about the NFL. Okay. What a surprise. Right? Football has some problematic issues. We are not going to go deep into those today. Right? But not a surprise. Those of you who feel comfortable outing yourselves, how many of you are fans to some degree of the NFL? All right, so I'm going to be talking to you all for a little bit. I see you. What's your team? The Ch okay, so we're going to talk about the Chiefs in just a little bit. Do not be afraid. All right, we are not doing this right now. We are not doing the whole rivalry thing right now. Not yet. All right, those of you who are the NFL fans, how many of you know who was playing in the big game this week, next week? How many? All right, who wants to tell me? Can you tell me? The Kansas City Chiefs and the 49ers. The Kansas City Chiefs and the 49ers. So I'm going to do a... Oh, you are getting ahead of me. All right. We're going to do a quick poll, especially amongst those who are the football fans, about who you are rooting for. And there will be four answers that I'm going to read off first 
So don't vote until you've heard all four answers. You are either supporting Kansas City, San Francisco, Taylor Swift, (laughs) or you're an NFL fan who does not care about this game. All right, so for those of you who wish to participate, you got to pick one of those, right? So, how many of you are going to be rooting for uh, Taylor Swift? We could do a whole other sermon about why a woman is being singled out in the NFL world and Barbie not getting an Oscar nod and all of that other fun stuff with this sermon. And if we do do that, we have to talk about America Frere. Whole other sermon. All right. How many of you are rooting for the 49ers? All right. All right. Fair amount. How many of you do not care? At all. All right, you don't care? I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, Go red team. Um, For those of you who know football, that's a joke. Um, How many of you are rooting for the Chiefs? Yes. One, two. Smallest contingent. Small. You can root for both of them. I just want everybody to have a good time. Right? Yep, you can root for both. I knew that this was going to be the answer, and let me tell you why, because I want to give you some history for the NFL impaired. Next Sunday will be the fourth time the Kansas City Chiefs have been to the Super Bowl in the last five years. And of those three previous games they've played, they've won two of them. Bonus points, who can tell me who they lost to? That's what I thought. All right. Tampa Bay Buccaneers with Tom Brady. All right. When they first got to the Super Bowl in 2019, it was their quarterback's third season, which is fairly young for a quarterback. He took them to the playoffs very far the year before in his second season, the year when he was a starter, right? The Kansas City Chiefs, the team that he plays for, previous to that, had only won two playoff games in the last 24 years, right? New quarterback, team that rarely gets to the championship game. We call this a Cinderella story, right? Right? How many people were rooting for the Chiefs back then? A lot. Everybody loved that story. But what happened? They kept winning. They kept winning. Janice, as a New England Patriots fan, knows exactly what happens when you root, when you have a team that keeps on winning. People start to dislike them. Oh my God, they're a dynasty. I have heard so many critiques about Patrick Holmes' behavior and not his performance because people are just like, I can't stand him anymore. And I get that. People are apathetic to actively rooting against the Chiefs. Why? Because nobody roots for Goliath. Instead, people love the underdog. We have always loved the underdog, that team that has a history of losing. There was a team that had a history of losing that got really far in the playoffs. Anybody know who it was? Detroit. Detroit. Do you know how many times Detroit's been to the Super Bowl? Zero. Zero. One of four teams. Do you know the other three teams? Browns. Of course, everybody knows that one. (laughs) Of course. We'll look it up on Google later. Um, But we had so many people who were rooting for Detroit because, oh my gosh, they've never been there. We want them to do so well. We love the underdog. Any of you ever watched American Idol? Right? How many of you love those stories when they first come in and you've got somebody who's really good who's in a small town and this might be their big break? Don't you root for them? Ever seen any movies about the underdog rising up? There's only a couple million of them. Rocky, Aaron Brockovich, uh, The Shawshank Redemption, Star Wars. 
there is something deep inside each and every one of us, deep inside the human condition that wants those little folks who don't have a chance to win, to succeed. We want to see the long shot pay off. We want to see, as a great man once said, the last become first and the first become last. As our reading this morning suggested, there is a long history throughout Hebrew and Christian Scripture of the underdog winning and making good. Moses, who led the Israelites out of Egypt, had a speech impediment and was a murderer. Not probably the guy you really want to lift up. And we talked a little bit about Joseph from Hebrew Scripture with that beautiful dream coat of his, the youngest of 12 brothers, who didn't like him and beat him and sold him into slavery into Egypt. And then he saves the tribes of Israel from a famine as well as Egypt itself. The Christians have this guy, Jesus, who came from the poorest of origins, simple profession, and his friends, fishermen, tax collectors, prostitutes. All of this points to one theme that we see consistently in Hebrew and Christian Scripture, and that is the love of the underdog. Now, there's a name for this thought in theological circles, and it is called liberation theology. It is the idea that God has a preferential option for the poor. God plays favorites. And not just the financially poor, those who have been abused, those who have been weakened, those who have been disenfranchised. And while there are plenty of stories in the Bible that back up this idea of the lowest among us being God's favorite, Liberation theology goes beyond the tales in Scripture because liberation theology is not a theoretical idea. Liberation theology is meant to be a practice. It is meant to be lived. The founder of liberation theology, Father Gustavo Gutierrez, writes in his book, A Theology of Liberation, and this is a long quote, so bear with me. Theology must be critical reflection of humankind on basic human principles. Only with this approach will theology be a serious discourse, aware of itself, in full possession of its conceptual elements but we are not referring exclusively to this epistemological aspect. Epistemological means to study the Bible and to look at the meanings. When we talk about theology as critical reflection, we also refer to a clear and critical attitude regarding economic and socio-cultural issues in the life and reflection of the Christian community. To disregard these is to deceive both oneself and others. But above all, we intend this term to express the theory of a definite practice. Theological reflection would then be necessarily a criticism of the society and the church insofar as they are called and addressed by the word of God. It would be a critical theory worked out in the light of the word, accepted in faith, and inspired by practical purpose, and therefore dissolubly linked to historical praxis. End quote. Liberation theology is meant to be critical of society, and that includes the church. Liberation theology is meant to be critical of how the church works. Last time a, a Catholic priest made those statements, he nailed 95 of them to a wall and had to flee the country. That's a Martin Luther reference. 
we have to get up with the idea, think about the idea with this theological reflection in liberal theology is not just thinking. It is doing. That we need to examine the world around us, its culture, how it affects the lowest among us, and work to make the ideals of liberation theology a reality. Gutierrez, a Catholic priest, is saying that faith without works is dead. Does that sound familiar? Book of James. He is saying that ideas are good and necessary, but they mean nothing without action. He is saying, in essence, deeds before creeds. Does that sound familiar to anybody? The phrase deeds before creeds, right? It's often used in that UU elevator speech, how we describe our theology. What you believe as a Unitarian Universalist is not nearly as important in how you live that belief. How you embody the ideas of worthiness for all, of the connections we share as one human family, uh, how you uh, show those ideals of respect and love for those who are considered the least among us, that is so much more important than the beliefs that call you to do that work. We are a faith that believes in justice. And we do the work to create justice for everyone. And while liberation theology is very much centered in the Christian belief of redemption, in its practice, it looks an awful lot like what Unitarian Universalism aspires to be. Liberation for all who dwell on this planet. It is about the work. That's the role of religious community. Or at least that's what it should be. If you're like me and I tell you it's all about the work of helping out the poor of religious community, maybe right now in your head you are thinking of certain religious communities that seem to be less interested in justice maybe more interested in interpreting their specific brand of theology as being the right one. We may think of those churches, those belief systems that show their preferential option for the poor, being more concerned about the poor's salvation in the next life and very much less concerned about the poor thriving in this life. Often these religious communities focus on maintaining their own success at the expense of those who are being oppressed. Those mega churches with the minister, with the private jet, the beautiful facilities that remain closed when a hurricane comes around and they need to house people. The work that they do is on the margins, for people on the margins, is selective at best performative at its worst. And according to liberation theology, and I think many of us here would agree with our own beliefs, that is not the work of the church. But then we have other congregations. We have congregations like Trinity, right here in Worcester with their breakfast program for the local unhoused population. Are they doing the work of the church? Can I get an amen for Trinity? Amen. People-to-people -people ministries. That was created by the local Wayne County Ministerial Association. They get a lot of support from First Pres. Are they doing the work of the church? Yes. How many of you agree with the creeds of Presbyterian? Actually, don't tell me. <laughs> because you don't need, you can agree with those, right? Some of us may agree with some of those creeds of First Press. Some of us may agree with the creeds of Trinity. And probably quite a few of us do not agree with those theologies. How many of you agree with the deeds they do? Are they doing the work of the church? Yes. 
they make their theology a practice a practice that works to embody that preferential opinion for option for the poor, a practice centered on mercy, justice, respect. Over the next few weeks, you are going to hear an awful lot about the works of our congregation. And why? Because our pledge drive is starting. You can laugh. And you're going to hear testimony. You're going to hear a lot of testimony from UU FWC members of friends about why this community is so important to them. There's going to be a lot of talk about the importance of community. And community is sorely needed and is vitally important to any religious community. It is a great place to go and to recharge our batteries our hearts, our souls. It is great to have friends and neighbors with common values and beliefs. It is vital to have those people to keep the work going. But at the heart, at the heart of it all, we gather because we believe we can make this world a better world place. We gather because we see that there are things that are unjust in this world that we can no longer say yes to. The way women's bodies are being legislated, the way LGBTQ folks are having their identities erased, the way working class is disappearing in this country and the 1% is thriving, the way black and brown bodies are criminalized, the way the earth is being disregarded and destroyed by greed and carelessness. And we gather, we gather together because we know we can do better. We know we can make this world a heaven for everybody, no exceptions. Deep down, all of us, all of us are here for the work. You're going to be asked to pledge in the next few weeks. You are going to be asked to put your hard-earned dollars towards this community. And I want to tell you right now, it is not to keep the lights on. If all we are doing is working to keep the lights on, I say we give up. I say we just sell the building and go do our own thing. If all we're doing is working to keep ourselves sustaining at the lowest possible way, then we are not here for the work. But if you think you can make this world a better place, if you think that our community has something that Wayne County, that Ohio needs, if you think there are people who are not represented and you want to help, if you have a preferential option for the poor, if you are here to do the work, I want you to think deep about what that looks like to you. I want you to invest deeply in this community because I think we could do so much does Wayne County need us? I'm going to do it again, folks. <laughs> and I'm going to do it again, and I want you to think, what is the thing that challenges you the most about Wayne County? What is the cause that you most believe in? What is the thing that you were sick and tired of seeing in this place that you want to make better? Do you want to make this world a better place? Yes. Then we will do the work together. We will live our mission justice, inclusion, and love for everybody. We are here to save the world with love. May it be so. <laughs>
I love you too, Barb. Are you ready to go? Are you ready to go on that journey with me? All right, all right. We need some more coffee. That's cool. Let us rise in body and spirit as we sing our closing hymn with gusto. Come and go with me. Before we extinguish the chalice, I'm going to remind you once again, last week I tried something new that I'm going to try again today. During the postlude, as Sharon plays so beautifully, I'm going to leave the chancel and I'm going to hang out by that door because one of the things I would love to do is I don't always get a chance to check in with everybody who wants to check in. And I really need to know what is going on in your lives. I really need to know how you are, and I so much want to have that opportunity. So I'm going to stand there. We're going to do the receiving line. If you are that introvert who is much more interested in coffee than the bald man with the beard, go around to the other door. Totally get that. But if you would like to check in with me, if you would just like to say hi, I would love to have that opportunity to greet you personally. The work is scary. I'm not going to lie. The work is really scary because it means setting some of our own stuff aside. Working for the marginalized, especially when you come from a position of privilege, can feel hard. It can feel difficult. And how many of you have done that work before and have loved how it felt? How many of you have felt the love that is created in caring for the least among us? All of you here are such powerful beings of love. Every one of you here is worthy. And I love all of the work you do, and I cannot wait for us to do even more. May it be so.